Hi, this is Callie Johnson, and I will be teaching Module 1 of Unit 1, so kicking things off here with the value of data in understanding the current status and mapping a path for an electric vehicle transition. So I'm Callie Johnson. I'm a Senior Transportation Marketing Analyst at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I spend about half my time uh, working on U.S. Um, vehicle deployment projects and the other half of my time working on international projects. Um, so uh, internationally, I've you know, helped a few countries um, develop their intended nationally de determined contributions. Um, I've done a few kind of broader wholesale of how to set a goal for greenhouse gas emissions or petroleum reduction and how to achieve that. Um, and and I've done a few projects um, on specifically how to transition to electric mobility and how, how to catalyze an electric vehicle market. Um, so I look forward to going uh, to teach in this class. So today we're going to start with an induction, an introduction to data supported transition to electric transport. Um, that'll cover the the data, the importance, and where and how to find it. Um, so we've grouped the data into two different groups, the foundational data and the specialized data. So we'll kind of talk about the difference between those two, and uh, then we'll dive into some particular data of the foundational data, which includes the transportation fuel use, the vehicle stock, the vehicle kilometers traveled, the ways to estimate missing foundational data, and then we'll hop into the specialized data, um, which includes the mode of travel, the access to home charging, gasoline prices, electricity tariffs, drive cycle profiles, electric generation mix, and geospatial data. And then finally, we will um, cover data storage, management, and access. So let's start by looking at the importance of data and the uses of data um, to support an uh, electric transportation. Um, let's take a look at the, from the 30,000 foot overview, um, data is central to every step of goal planning, whether it be a greenhouse gas reduction goal or a petroleum reduction goal or, a, um, a, or an air quality improvement goal. Um, and it's also central to the implementation and tracking of that goal. Uh, so what we have here is a, a diagram of of setting one of those goals. So you have at the far left hand side, the petroleum or greenhouse gas reduction goal, um, which is fed by data in this central data repository and depository, which we'll want to develop. Um, quite often we use a wedge analysis uh, to break the goal down into sub goals. Um, and usually electrified transport will be one of those sub goals for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, that requires more data, which we'll, we'll talk about to help um, set that sub goal and realize what's achievable through electrifying transportation. Uh, then we have the project proposal and assessment. We wanna break that electrified um, transportation sub goal down into specific projects uh, that will enable us to achieve that, that goal of a certain portion electrified transit and a certain portion of the fuel use um, transitioned over to electrified uh, transportation. Um, and then data also helps us to prioritize the projects or the policies uh, that we're using to electrify transportation. Um, and then um, we want to baseline all of these projects and, and policies and just to, to be able to, to track the progress of, the, of transitioning from gasoline or, or diesel uh, to electric vehicles. We want to be able to verify the reductions and then those verified reductions go back into the central data depository in order to, to help track them and to inform other potential projects and policies, including in your, your country and other countries. So let's start by talking about the foundational data. Uh, foundational data broadly defines a region's transportation system. It's pretty fundamental to the transportation system. Uh, the first piece you have here on the left is the vehicle kilometers traveled. How many 
vehicle kilometers does it take um, driving to keep to keep your economy and your your society functioning um, you have uh, to give an example of two opposite extremes uh, you can have a low vehicle kilometers traveled per capita country where there is a lot of bicycle riding pedestrians um, if people live close to where they work and if there's good mass transit then it doesn't take many vehicle kilometers traveled to to keep things operating um, as in the opposite of that would be if in a society where people live far from where they work far from um, other destinations that they go to and they tend to drive single occupancy vehicles then there's a high vehicle kilometers traveled per capita um, number. Uh, the next piece of information that is very foundational to a transportation system is the transportation fuel use. Uh, how much fuel is being used by the vehicles that are powering the transportation system. And finally, you have the vehicle stock. Uh, what, what vehicles are being used and what type are they and a few other characteristics of them. And it's key to keep in mind that this foundational data, as important as it is, um, there are ways to estimate missing foundational data and kind of fill it in. And so we'll talk about those um, estimation methods also. So let's start with transportation fuel use. Um, this is generally nearly all the petrol used in a country, and it's a large portion of the diesel. So if you can find that petrol number, it's a pretty safe bet that that's all being used to power transportation. Um, however, in many countries, diesel powers electricity generation in boats. So sometimes you'll have to find um, from the utility how much diesel was used in electricity generation and subtract that out. Um, so the uses of transportation fuel use, um, you can estimate the transportation emissions, both greenhouse gas emissions and local criteria pollutants that, um, that are deleterious to air quality. Um, another use is to estimate the macroeconomic and the energy security benefits of electrification. If you're importing all of your petroleum products, um, then you stand to benefit if you uh, transition from 
using diesel and gasoline to using um, electric, electric vehicles, especially if you have a good source of renewable electricity. And finally, um, it can be used to estimate the increased electricity demand from electrifying transportation. So you can prepare the grid and kind of know um, what to expect in terms of increased demand when you swap your vehicles out. Um, you can convert uh, the, the petrol and the diesel use um, to kilowatt hours and estimate the increased demand on the on the grid uh, so that the utility can can be prepared and know know what's coming in the years a, ahead. Um, where do you find this data? Um, I generally start with the Ministry of, of Revenue um, because all gasoline and diesel is taxed uh, via excise taxes. So they've got that data. Sometimes the Ministry of Revenue isn't the easiest place to find it. Sometimes it's buried deep. Um, and so in that case, it might be good to pursue alternative sources such as the ministry tracking imports. Um, if you're importing your petrol and your diesel directly and not refining it, um, then you can, uh, you can track it through whatever ministry is tracking the imports. Um, but keep in mind, you have to account for any exports also. Uh, if you've got um, an inflow and outflow, uh, you want the kind of the, the net inflow of um, uh, of gasoline and diesel uh, to track as what you're using in your transportation system. Um, many ministries of, in, of energy um, get that information and make it available. Um, this is quite often the, the most user-friendly place to find the data. Um, generally, they will get it from the Ministry of Revenue or the Ministry of, of Imports and, and Exports and make it um, serve it up in a user-friendly way. And then finally, um, EIA's oil information um, has oil final consumption by product, which is what the figure we have on the right here. Um, it covers 36 countries, so, so not great coverage, but um, there, there, there's a a decent chance that they will cover your country and have that information. Um, the other disadvantage of um, IEA's um, data is that it's a little, uh, it's not the most up to date. Uh, as you can see here, they have um, in EIA's or IEA's oil information 2020, they have uh, product information up through 2018. So it's a couple of years behind. Um, but if you can't find it in any of these other locations, uh, keep in mind that you might be able to find it at, at IEA. The next, next aspect of foundational data that we want to pursue is vehicle stock. Um, that's how many vehicles are in your country. And this generally also includes the make, model, vehicle type, and model year of a vehicle, which is also very helpful. Um, it's also called vehicles in operation um, as some trackable databases or, or the number of, of registrations. And you wanna make sure that it is the number of registrations and not the number of new registrations because um, some countries track the number of new registrations, like how many have been added to the database every year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's better to have the registrations that have been there for a, a long time, the number of vehicles in operation that are, that are in the database. Um, so this is the most important data for determining the potential EV market and the future sales. Um, um, some, there are more electric vehicles of certain vehicle types, you know, such as hatchbacks and sedans and fewer of other types so far, you know, such as pickup tr trucks or heavy duty vehicles. And so getting the vehicle stock by vehicle type helps you see how compatible or how many of your vehicles would be compatible with an electric vehicle substitution. And then it also helps you determine the potential for fleet partners. If you know that you have so many transit buses, uh, for example, um, you could you could um, view them as potential fleet partners if you wanted to 
employ a strategy where you convert your electric transit buses and work with your local transit authority um, for an early adopter. Um, so where do you get the vehicle stock data? Um, the, if you have a ministry of motor vehicles, um, and by the way, all these ministries, I've kind of used a generic name. I know that every country has different uh, names for their ministries, but I think you can get the general idea of what ministry I'm, I'm speaking of and what, what your um, related ministry is. Um, so the Ministry of Motor Vehicles should keep a tally of the, the vehicles registered. Um, the Ministry of Revenue um, also should ha um, keep track of the number of vehicles that have paid the registration tax um, or other associated vehicle taxes. Um, Commercial banks are actually a pretty good source for this information in a lot of countries, and that's because they track assets. They want to know who has a car that they could, you know, potentially put a lien on, um, or, you know, if someone faulted on their loan, um, what assets they have that they could, that they could get. Um, so in a lot of countries, commercial banks have this database. Um, there are some larger databases um, that are global um, for, for purchase. Um, Experian, who's also the credit agency, um, and IHS Market uh, cover nearly 80 countries, um, and they have this these databases, which they call the Vehicles in Operation, the VIO databases. Um, and then finally, if, if you can't get this data from any of these sources, it can be estimated from the sales if you have vehicle life estimates and even if you don't have vehicle life estimates we can we can make some um some estimates of those uh, of vehicle life based on other countries and um, the vehicle lives that they are seeing and experiencing the, the third set of foundational data is the vehicle kilometers traveled or the vkt this is the kilometers that motorized vehicles travel on an annual basis. Um, it's quite useful. Uh, per capita VKT indicates how motorized a country's transportation is. It indicates the amount and type of infrastructure uh, that is likely to have built, been built to accommodate the transportation system. So high per capita VKT countries have more road lanes and parking spaces as opposed to low per capita VKT countries have more mass transit and pedestrian infrastructure. The sources of VKT uh, can be from traffic counts, um, which most ministries of transportation do. Um, and then uh, lately, um, there's an increasing number of GPS services uh, that can be used for VKT and translated to, to VKT. Um, there's actually two of them that are are in operation in many countries um, that sell their VKT data for various purposes. Um, one is Inrix and another is Waze. Um, so those might be worth pursuing um, if your Ministry of Transportation doesn't have this data. But your Ministry of Transportation should have uh, this data in one form or the other. Um, so the image I posted on the right-hand side here is from a project uh, that I did with with Tonga, um, where they they don't have the full VKT, but they do have, they did set up a number of traffic counts in pretty um, strategic locations, um, where they um, counted the number of vehicles going by um, at certain days of the week and certain times, um, where we're able to work with them um, by looking at the the population of kind of of these various towns and where the vehicles were going to and going from and get a rough estimate for the VKT. Um, in a lot of smaller countries, a rough, rough estimate is, is better than no estimate at all. And so it was helpful uh, for the purposes of this project. So that's just one example of how when you don't have the ideal data, um, you can use traffic counts to kind of estimate the, the VKT. So the foundational data is quite important. So what do we do if we're missing some of it, uh, which happens quite frequently? Um, fortunately, there are relationships between the three key pieces that you know enable us to to use 
proxy data and use um, other data to help us estimate them. And so you have the three key pieces of foundational data here, the fuel use, VKT, and vehicle stock. And then in the green boxes here, you have these relationships between the two um, that, that pretty much bring it down just to um, algebra, to sim simple algebra between the two. So let's look if you have, um, let's look at the relationship between the fuel use and the VKT. Um, the relationship there is fuel efficiency. And so, <clears throat> so fuel efficiency in it quantified in liters per 100 kilometers is just the fuel consumption um, over 100 VKT. So if you're missing either the fuel use or the VKT, but you have a pretty good idea on what your fuel efficiency of your vehicles is um, based on the vehicle type and other countries, um, other countries and what, what their fuel economy is, um, then you can estimate either VKT or transportation um, fuel use, whichever one you're missing. Um, and the same with the transportation fuel use versus vehicle stock. Let's say you are missing the vehicle stock, but you know how much fuel was used. Um, there are estimates and you can use proxies from other similar countries that enable you to uh, figure out the annual fuel, fuel use per vehicle in order to make that conversion. Um, likewise, between vehicle stock and vehicle kilometers traveled, um, there are some, some patterns as to how many vehicle uh, kilometers traveled, each vehicle travels per, per year um, in similar countries and uh, similar circumstances that would enable you to use proxy data um, to estimate bet the, between the two of these. Um, and so it's, um, so a good place to get the fuel efficiency data is from the Global Fuel Economy Initiative um, that tracks fuel economy data in a wide variety of, of countries. Um, and then when dealing with these uh, relationships between these three uh, pieces of foundational data, it's good to segment vehicles as much as, pop, as, as, much as possible. So instead of just looking your, at your entire vehicle pool, it's best to break it down at least by light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. And it'd be good to, if possible, to break it down even more. Um, that improves the, the precision. So if you could break it down according to, let's say buses versus delivery trucks versus long haul trucks, um, then we have much better assumptions as to the fuel efficiency, the annual kilometer, um, the an annual VKT per vehicle and the annual fuel use per vehicle. Um, and so it's good to break down your vehicle population into smaller subpopulations by vehicle group. Um, I just wanted to like put it out there that um, an international data depository would make it much easier for um, for looking at proxy data in various other countries and similar countries. Um, so this is something that you know, we need to we need to get to work on. So in the previous slide, I mentioned using proxy data from other similar countries to estimate some foundational data for your own country. And I just want to give a couple of examples of how that can be done. Um, so on the left here, we have a plot between urban density, how many people per hectare um, for various cities, and then the per capita um, private passenger transport energy use. Um, and so this is a pretty strong relationship. It has an R square of 0.86. So if you're, if you're missing the transportation fuel consumption in your country, essentially you can use your your density in in your different cities to get a decent estimate for the transportation energy use per person, um, and then you can aggregate it up to the the total energy use on on transportation in in that city. Um, likewise, with this plot on the on the right here, 
if you don't know your vehicle kilometers traveled, um, but you do know your GDP, um, there's um, a decent relationship between the GDP per capita um, when when countries have have developed and grown their GDP from 5,000. There, the metric is. 1990 international dollars, uh, which I, I won't get into, but um, but essentially when when going from $5,000 per year up to $20,000 per year is when this correlation is the is the strongest. Um, and so if you don't know your VKT uh, per capita, but you do know your GDP, um, you can kind of you can find yourself on this plot of GDP. Um, take into account uh, some other aspects such as um, such as infrastructure build out, such as population density, um, uh, such as uh, is it an are you on an island or a um, pretty spread out uh, landscape, and you can uh, work your way back to the um, personal VKT per capita. And then your total VKT. Um, so that's just a couple of examples of how to use proxy data from other countries. So now we're moving on from the foundational data uh, to the um, more specific data that is uh, more directly tied to electrification. And so we want to start with the mode of travel. Um, so this ranges from single occupancy vehicles where people are driving their own vehicle, uh, very uh, inefficient, um, walking, biking, scooter, microtransit, max taxi, or max mass transit, taxi, the transportation network companies, TNCs like Uber and Lyft, um, carpooling counts as um, a different mode of travel than the single occupancy vehicle. Um, and depending on the country, there are even more modes of travel. Um, this data is used to determine how to allocate resources in order to support the most travelers in the most economical or environmentally friendly way. And it also takes space into consideration. Um, it, you um, use the motor travel data to uh, determine how to avoid congestion as well. Um, it, and it, most importantly for our purposes today, it helps determine which vehicles are best to electrify. Uh, this this data can be broken down by age, gender, income, uh, trip type in order to um, enable resource allocation in an equitable manner. Um, so you can see if, if a group, if an underserved community is all using, let's say, the bus, um, you know that um, funneling resources to the buses uh, may be maybe the most equitable use of a given amount of, of money. Uh, this data is generally collected through travel surveys, uh, sometimes part as, a, as part of a census. And as such, they're often available through the Mil uh, Ministry of Transportation or whatever ministry performs the census, usually Ministry of Population or something like that. Extrapolations can be made from other countries with similar, similar population density and per capita income levels. Uh, per the previous slide, there are some decent relationships um, to tie countries together to enable um, extrapolations of this data. Um, and this data is available for many countries in, on Statista, uh, which is a website that you know has a wide range in quality of data. Some things on Statista are, are not that great, uh, but it seems like mode of travel there's a there's a decent data set um, on Statista. Uh, so what we have here at the bottom is a screenshot from the um, Mexi um, Mexican 2015 intercessal survey. And this gives the breakdown of the mode of travel for Mexican students going to school. So I mentioned how you want to get a specific group of people. Um, so it has the students going to school um, and it breaks that mode of travel down for the students. A piece of information or a data set that's uh, really important to the prospects of electrifying transportation is um, who has access to home charging. Globally, 50 to 80 percent of charging events uh, have occurred at home. <clears throat> it's important to keep in mind that this is amongst early adopters, uh, so that may be changing as we get into uh, later stage adopters. 
Um, lack of home charging availability is often found to be a bar barrier to EV adoption. Um, so those two points are just kind of reiterating how important access to home charging is, at least in the early phases of, of adoption. Unfortunately, no countries uh, that I know of have data sets um, of the ability to charge at home. Um, so we use backups. Uh, one of them is the number of houses or the percent of houses with garages and carports. Uh, that's the that's the closest we can come to capability to charge at home. And um, secondly, if a country doesn't have that data set, you can look at the share buildings that are detached and semi-detached houses. Um, at least in the US, we found good correlation between uh, the, the houses that are detached or semi-detached and the ones that have garages or carports. Um, so the sources of this information can be from property titles, uh, from uh, house or residential registrations, and even real estate listings. So this could come from the Ministry of Housing or sometimes private companies that offer real estate list listing search services, um, such as in, in the US, we have um, a website called Zillow, for example, that has uh, this kind of information. Gasoline prices are another important data set, and this is because uh, gasoline prices are significantly <coughs> related to EV sales, at least in the United States. Um, so the higher the gasoline prices, the, um, the higher the EV sales are. Uh, this is useful when determining if EV purchase incentives are needed and what magnitude. Um, good sources of gasoline prices would be the ministries of energy. Most of them track gasoline prices. In addition, many countries are included in the IEA's Energy Price 2020. Um, I have a screenshot on the right-hand side of their gasoline price page uh, where you can look at gasoline prices by country, then click on the country and get, get details. Uh, backup source um, would be the petroleum excise taxes, um, the Ministry of Revenue. Uh, they should track the prices uh, since they've been taxing um, gasoline based on based on the price. Of course, the other side of the equation of fuel costs uh, would be the electricity tariffs. So that's important information to get also. Um, so energy price, that's the price you pay per kilowatt hour, affects project economics less than gasoline price. Um, that's largely due to the fact that uh, EVs are three times more efficient than gasoline vehicles. Uh, therefore, that price of electricity um, has much less impact on the, on the economics. Um, demand charges, uh, which is the price you pay per kilowatt in order to, which, which is set um, at the highest demand you have uh, throughout the month, uh, that can be very impactful. That can steer projects away from DC fast charging. Uh, so that's good to keep track of. The time of use pricing uh, can be beneficial to EVs uh, because they are, um, at least in the US, uh, vehicles, light duty vehicles are plugged, are parked 95% of the time. So EVs would be available to charge during the uh, low pricing for time of use pricing. Um, so the source of electricity tariffs uh, would be utilities, uh, get it directly from the utility. And um, EI, or IEA 2020 uh, has this information aggregated nationally, um, although it's good to look at it um, at the utility level, because even within, within a country, it could differ quite a bit between utilities. Um, and so on the right-hand side here, we have the electricity price distribution across the different countries from IEA. And that's just kind of interesting to see the, the prices. Um, you have the industry um, prices per, per megawatt hour on the, um, on the x-axis, and you have the residential prices on the y-axis. So you can see um, Germany and Cabo Verde and Cyprus have some of the most expensive um, electricity tariffs, and you know, countries such as Algeria have some of the least expensive. Drive cycle profiles define the distances driven, the stops and starts, the acceleration patterns, and the ge geographical patterns of specific vehicles. Um, so this information uh, helps determine the battery size, the best battery size, the 
um, regenerative braking potential, um, the needed charging infrastructure, and the economic payback uh, for, <clears throat> for various vehicles. So this is generally done for individual fleets uh, where they can be tracked. Uh, and Andrew uh, Mainz uh, in the next uh, session is gonna be going into much greater detail on this. And so I'm just going to very lightly cover it and basically introduce the topic uh, for him. Um, so it can be done at various levels of sophistication and cost. You know, you can, you can dive in really deep and have a thorough analysis done, or you can put a couple of GPS trackers on, on buses and track them. Uh, we can even mail them and have them be tracked. Um, <clears throat> and so that comes up, um, the, the tracking software um, feeds into a map, which is what we have on the, on the right here, uh, where this is just an example of one of the buses that we tracked um, in Kingston uh, as we we're doing a drive cycle analysis for them. And uh, you can see it lets you know where, where the bus goes and then it ties it to information on acceleration. And you know, it's pretty useful information when determining and foremost what battery size the, the bus needs and where the recharging infrastructure should be. Um, so there are there are trends that are common between certain vehicle types, such as transit buses, such as trash trucks, things like that, delivery trucks, um, and these are summarized in NREL's Fleet DNA database. So I encourage you to Google Fleet DNA NREL and go in and look at the uh, commonalities between these different uh, drive cycles. Um, GPS devices can also be a source of non-fleet drive cycles. Um, you know, most most of us have a GPS device, either our phone or our car GPS, um, traveling on the road with us, and that, um, like it or not, um, that is being that data is being sent to certain places. Um, it's commonly used for you know, for example, in Google Maps, uh, which is fed by Waze, um, that serves up the the traffic for us. Um, it, GPS devices are tracked on the road and that feeds back to the Google Maps um, to let you know where there are traffic problems. So it's all um, quite useful information. Um, in their um, Waze and Inrix um, are two examples of, of companies that harvest um, this this data and they anonymize it. That's that's important to note. Um, so it can't be tracked to any any given vehicle. It's just anonymous um, drive cycles of the, the average vehicle on on the road. Um, and so these uh, might be available in your in your country. They're available in quite a few countries. Um, so that could be a good source of drive cycles from non-fleet vehicles. More broadly, geospatial data is very <clears throat> important when planning out an EV rollout. Um, so this is the uh, so this is valuable when planning where to locate new EV charging infrastructure, among other things. Um, so data files of value, uh, there are a number of them. Uh, one of them is the residential and commercial zoning, which can be helpful to showcase community patterns within a city, sorry, commuting patterns within a city and identify potential EV um, supply equipment hosts. Um, so that would be, um, for, so essentially that would be showing like where the residents will be commuting to the commercial areas. Um, and then you can highlight, um, say there is, I don't know, a coffee shop along the way, or there is a uh, convenience store along the way that could be a good potential EV, EVSE equipment host. Uh, traffic volume maps help planners estimate how many EVs could potentially drive along a given road segment. Demographic data files can inform planners as to the areas with populations most likely to adopt EVs or, or underserviced communities uh, that um, need to be kept in mind when equitably um, funding changes in transportation, such as electrification. Um, utility feeder maps, um, ideally tied to feeder capacity data, can help ensure that high-powered chargers are installed in locations where the grid can best handle their additional load. 
And so that's what <clears throat> we have a screenshot of here on the right is the ArcFM offers a grid feeder map running in ArcGIS long time, um, online. So you can purchase that feeder map layer um, within ArcGIS that uh, helps you see where the various feeders are. And so if you are planning a really high powered, let's say one of the new 350 kilowatt uh, DC fast chargers, you probably wouldn't want to put two of them under the same feeder. You would want to you know, spread them out amongst these different feeders. Um, I'm not exactly sure what all countries uh, ArcFM offers these grid feeder maps on. I don't think it's very many. And so it's, um, if they don't have it, uh, the best source would probably be the utility itself. Um, they definitely have it. It's just a question if they're willing to share it or not. Um, and so uh, most of these data files are likely to be housed in local governments, local planning boards, in transportation authorities, um, in addition to the, to the electric utilities. Uh, they're just uh, data sources that are they tend to be more valuable at the local level, and so that's kind of where they are usually housed. Your electric generation mix is also an important data set uh, to keep in mind. This allows you to estimate um, the greenhouse gas reductions of electrifying your transportation system and also the, your criteria pollutant reductions. Um, it, so that is what we have uh, on display here in the in the figure below. Um, this is an example uh, done in Mexicali, Mexico, based on their uh, generation mix. Um, the um, on the left you have the lifetime um, the kilograms of CO2 emissions uh, per 100 kilometers, and then so on the far left here you have the starting points of various vehicles. Um, you can see the vehicle that emits the most is the Toyota Highlander, which we put in for just an example of an SUV. Um, below that, we have the Nissan Versa, which is a conventional vehicle, and we chose that because it is the same vehicle um, as the electric Nissan Leaf, uh, which is the blue line down at the bottom. Um, then we have the, the Toyota Prius um, ATV, um, which as, as you can see is um, pretty low emitting, uh, but then you have um, in red the Chevy Volt, and you can see both the Chevy Volt and the Nissan Leaf uh, decrease, the emissions decrease as the renewable electricity increases. Um, so in Mexicali here, you're already starting with about 27% renewable electricity, and then, um, and then as you can see is, as you increase that electric or that renewable electricity portion, the Nissan Leaf drops almost to zero greenhouse gas emissions, and the Chevy Volt um, drops um, about half as quickly um, because of because it's still using some gasoline. And I should also mention that it um, the electric generation mix helps time your EV charging to maximize the use of renewables. So those are the main data sets that would be nice to have when electrifying your transportation system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about data storage, management, and access. Um, government data should be publicly available, and this is in the best interest of the economy, um, because if you make, avail make it available to innovators, um, that helps uh, come up with solutions uh, to electrify transportation uh, that um, it's just better to have uh, the data available so more people can be working on solutions uh, to the electrification um, hurdles. Um, and then it's also good for local decision makers to have that data as they're steering their local economies and, and local transportation fleets towards electrification. States and regions should be able to access each other's data um, so they can compare with each other and um, be able to um, do some of, use each other's data as, as proxy data, kind of as we mentioned earlier between countries, uh, different states, uh, regions, or provinces can do the same. Um, it's good to have a gatekeeper or have quality control. Um, you don't want anyone to just be able to post whatever data they have come up with um, on, on this central 
data um, database that's accessible by by the some form of internet, um, you need some you need a gatekeeper to make sure that it is good quality and is reliable. Um, and it's also good to standardize the software so that uh, as many of people as possible can access it and use it in the software that they're familiar with. So in summary, uh, there are there are three key data sets, uh, the transportation fuel use, the vehicle stock, and the vehicle kilometers traveled um, that really describe the fundamentals of a transportation system. And if you're missing one of these, there are ways to there are ways to calculate them and fill in the gaps, um, and there are way, also ways to use proxy data from other countries. And then you have your specialized data down below that helps when converting your transportation system over to electric vehicles. Uh, one of those is, is the mode of travel. Are people driving single occupancy vehicles? Are they carpooling? Are they taking the bus? Um, things like that. Another is their access to home charging. Another is gasoline prices, which gives an indication of, of how ready people are going to be to adopt electric vehicles. Um, likewise with electricity tariffs, uh, that's not as reliable of an indicator as to how likely people are to ad adopt electric vehicles, uh, but it's also good to have, um, to know kind of specialized things such as how high are the demand charges or are there time of use um, tariffs that can fit particularly well with electric vehicles. Um, you, it's nice to have drive cycle profiles so you can target key fleets and help them choose the right equipment. Um, it's good to have geospatial data so you can plan out um, your, your infrastructure and make sure that you are not leaving um, underserviced communities out of, out of the electric vehicle system. Um, and finally, it's good to have the electric electricity generation fuel mix to make sure that you are getting those those emissions reductions uh, that that you want and that you want um, that you are adopting electric vehicles for. Uh, so thank you, and I look forward to talking to you all in the Q and A session in a week or so.